uh, I like to build robots. And uh, I guess my goal is to make robots that are, have uh, some of the performance that people and animals have. And by that I mean uh, the mobility, uh, the agility, speed, dexterity. Uh, people and animals are just remarkable in their capabilities. And to this day, no machines really come close. But I am an optimist who believes that we will build machines that meet and eventually exceed many of the things uh, people do. Even people, like in the first session this morning, uh, really maniacs about their performance. Well, I'm a maniac about uh, what I hope we can get robotics to do. Sometimes I wonder if some of that comes from my personal inability to be an athlete. When I was a kid, I was kind of a runt. And uh, now I'm making up for that by hopefully, eventually, building machines that uh, can uh, uh, make up for my limitations. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start out by showing you some inspiration. I'm going to show three videos. One is inspiration, one sort of a status report. And finally, uh, we'll get up to the question of whether you should be afraid or excited uh, by robots. So uh, here are some animals. Uh, traveling uh, on terrain that's really remarkable terrain. And uh, these animals just work effortlessly. Uh, they, they're strong, they're coordinated, they have perception. Uh, they make all these pieces work together in a way where uh, it just looks natural. Here are two animals, both running for their lives. Not only the antelope, who's trying to run away, but the cheetah, who's uh, running uh, to get his next meal. And it's really remarkable. And people are great athletes, too. Uh, it's amazing uh, what we can do uh, when we put our minds to it in terms of our strength and agility. This, this video is just pirated from YouTube, so you can find it there somewhere. Um, it's really uh, inspiring. So I think the big concept of how you go about building robots like this is to try and mix together a couple of pieces. And to some degree, I feel like a little bit of the old technology world, because in the lower left bubble there, uh, we deal with the body of the robot or the body of the animal. And th that's kind of old technology. Here, I'll go to the, uh, to the robot version of this slide. You know, the mechanical design, which involves hydraulics and sensors and, you know, old-fashioned stuff by this uh, meeting standards. Uh, but it interacts with computers that provide intelligence. The intelligence isn't like Google's intelligence that knows all the information in the world, or a chess playing program's intelligence that uh, reasons what the moves are and all that. It's an intelligence that has to do with how a body behaves. So right now, I am performing a miraculous act of standing in front of you without tipping over. And I can do it even only on, standing on one foot. And I can even do it while I'm jumping. Thank you. <laughs> and the amazing thing is I had to do almost nothing to learn to do that. All of you do that. These animals all do it. And we know relatively little about how it's done. So I'm a big believer in uh, the interaction between the computer control and the physical machine and the understanding of the, of the behavior. And some people think computers just dictate behavior to bodies or brains tell the bodies what to do. But it's really not like that at all. The machine has to interact with a physical world, which is also providing its own instructions. So the control is just providing suggestions, and then the body has its own rules and is making its own suggestions, and the two work together. So when we design these, these robot systems, we're working at the interaction between the physical world, the physics of the body, and the things that the intelligent controller can provide. And those all interact to get behavior. So now I'll show you a little bit of the behavior I'm talking about in case you haven't seen it. Those of you who watched YouTube have probably seen some of the big dog shots, but I have some stuff in here that you probably uh, haven't seen as well. So this is a four-legged robot, uh, not to be mistaken by two people uh, hidden under a canoe. <laughs> and if you watch YouTube, you can find plenty of spoofs. I'm very proud of the number of big dog spoofs that are out there. It's over, over 20 now. Um, and this robot has an onboard power supply. It has a brain. It has sensors which know what the orientation of the robot is as it's uh, moving. Uh, and it has some control algorithms that are very clever about 
measuring what the status of the robot is, and then figuring out what action it can take with its legs in order to respond. Here's another example where we uh, accidentally uh, ran the robot across some ice in our parking lot. We, we didn't do that on purpose, and the uh, algorithms kicked in. We're really into running. I actually started my career uh, making robots that run rather than walk, because after all, you have to run before you can walk, is what our motto is. It's, it really is simpler than walking. Now, what's the value of a robot like this? Aside from the grand goal of building machines that can do what people and animals do, uh, we're interested in building vehicles that can go any place on Earth without roads and other prepared surfaces. And so here's an example of the robot previously on the snow, and here traveling on mud, and here uh, in water. All situations that wheeled and tracked vehicles have a difficult time, but legged things excel, especially people and animals, and now the robots we're making. This is um, a follow-on to Big Dog, which is a bigger dog. It weighs, <laughs> it, weigh, it's, it weighs about three times as much and can carry about four times as much as Big Dog. And we're just getting this out into testing, so here it is out in the field. One of the things you may notice is that there's a guy walking in front, and Big Dog has a perception system that's looking at that guy in front and going wherever he goes. So there's no driver. The robot is just following along the same path in the terrain using a variety of sensors, and the whole time it's using leg sensors in order to react to variations in the terrain uh, so that it can keep its balance when it goes. In the lab, we're working, this is the same size and weight as what you just saw in the field, and we're working on um, dealing with obstacles like uh, logs, and also teaching him how to get up when he falls down, which is an important uh, ability. If you're really going to go out and do a real task or a mission, uh, your robot needs to be able to tolerate that. We're also working on a human form robot. Um, originally, we designed this to uh, test chemical protection equipment. So we're doing this for the, the US Army. And uh, they're interested in having a thing that can go into a place where there's real poison gases and determine what the behavior of a suit is. So this robot's the actual size and shape of a 50th percentile American man. Um, and it can do a variety of tasks that a, a person does. We have a list of them uh, that we had to do. Uh, to get it to have shoulders strong enough to do this was a real, uh, a real accomplishment. Um, in fact, all the mechanical design to get all the behavior and the functionality that's packed into this thing uh, to work right uh, is a real, uh, a real challenge. Thank you very much.